frequency conversations. We are still carrying on with Sergeant Major SW4E, the man we served with. Honor in uh, one reconnaissance commando, one reconnaissance regiment, as it became later. As an explosives expert, he uh, was involved in all the major operations, the one you read about in the newspapers, as well as in the books, as well as his own book, which is coming out soon. It's here behind me. Have a good look at it. You will not regret it. Yes, we are, I think we are now at Lobito. Perhaps you can tell us about that. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Uh, planning from uh, Defense Force HQ is to disrupt uh, the field depots in Lobito. And for that, uh, one reconnaissance regiment was tasked and with uh, four reconnaissance, which is our seaborne regiment, uh, to actually do the uh, transport for us. Um, okay, so it was probably one of the most uh, rehearsed operations because it was our first one. Uh, there weren't something that we could work on. So we had to... We, uh, work out all what we call emergency drills. Emergency drills is basically, what if? What if this will happen? What if that has happened? What if the boat capsized? What if the limpet mine goes off too early? And all that is rehearsed over and over and over and over again. So that if that goes, anything goes wrong, then immediately this action uh, based on that. For instance, there were three uh, emergency RVs if we have to escape and evade. Ironically, going north, the Bito is like more or less in the center of Angola, uh, a beach town, and our escape and evasion would be up north because we thought that everybody will think we're going south. So if you miss the first RV, your time schedule for the second, and if you miss the, th the third RV, then you walk. And I think it's a couple, it's a thousand plus cases in that you have to escape in your way back to Namibia. Okay, so we started, um, it was divided uh, into three, uh, let's call it uh, separate re refineries. The first one was fuel tanks. Uh, the second one was, I think, four or five tanks. And then the last one was a tank that was connected to the cement factory. So each were identified and each was allocated to a different team. And then we start our rehearsing. Um, ironically, at that stage, we didn't, Seaborn didn't have fancy equipment. So we would have uh, utilized the French uh, Zodiac, Rubber Duck, I think Mark II, uh, with one outboard engine. So not very fancy where you can, in a ski boat, where you can uh, outrun uh, other kind of patrol boats. With the rubber duck, you're vulnerable. The other benefit of that, it was a low profile. So you can uh, maneuver in between. Um, it was very, um, it was kept a secret. Our first rehearsal started in Durban because we had a, a the oil refinery very close to uh, to our military base, which was on the bluff. And we visited these fuel tanks and um, just to have a look at it. And then of also, we had guys from EMLC, that's the guys that manufactured the special equipment for us and they manufactured this limpet mine specifically for us and it was I think the mine consists out of PETN with when it detonates the, the actual temperature is much higher than instance for on P4 or T, TNT or that kind. So, and then also we had to work out the exact height <clears throat> that you would put a limpet mine. Taking in consideration that the bottom part of the of a tank is solid, is cement or whatever. So there's no benefit of putting the limpet there. So it has to be about eye level around there. Uh, that's where we plan to put the limpets. Okay, then we started with, um, at that stage, we had no idea from the operator's side, what are we going to do? 
Uh, I was 20 years old, so I'm still a youngster. That stage, yeah, two, two years in, in the Defence Force, two years in South African Special Forces, one reconnaissance. Um, then we flew, uh, we left with a two Dakotas, if I remember correctly. Probably one as well. It was uh, small teams. And then we realized we're flying south and not north. I mean, we always had the bush warfare in, in mind, although we realized this is not bush warfare. And then we realized we're going south to Langaban. Now, Langaban is where four recce was stationed. And then we had a place where they called Donkerhat. If you translate that in English, it's Dark Owl, <laughs> direct translation. That yeah, was the still the place now. That's great. Uh, yeah, number one, yeah. A southern part of uh, Cape Province. Donkerhat itself um, was uh, the operational area that was limited to anybody. So there was no civilians there. It was only the operators and uh, that specific operation wanted to support of stuff. Somebody had to cook for us. Yeah, we were treated by the Foreki guys. Uh, I had, um, we had crayfish, and the other one is what I call parlemoon. And like a shell, uh, in, in a shell that sucks onto the rocks. Albuquerque or something like that. <laughs> We're going to show a photo of that. Uh, yeah, so for us it was a treat, and then uh, we met the Navy guys, and, and Captain Woodburn was allocated as the overall commander of the two strike crafts that need to transport us. Sorry, we were four. We were four Zodiacs in total, two, two per strike craft. So then our serious rehearsal started. Uh, we'd be of climbing uh, onto the strike car, loading the Zodiac. So you will have a full dress rehearsal, including the Zodiac will be at the back of the strike craft, two, two on each strike craft. And then I would have a crane uplifting the Zodiac and download it. Uh, the engine started while it's still in the air before it hits the water. And then immediately when it hits, it will pick up the same speed as the strike craft. And then it will go on either side of the strike craft. And that will happen sim simultaneously with the other strike craft. Um, at that stage, we, were, we weren't informed where we were going. And then we had, uh, I think the int guy was Piet, Piet Kutsia. Yeah. He had models there and air photos. He had models of the excellent refinery plant. And he built a model out of that. So there was a lot of detail that go into this kind of operation. I think the rehearsal was probably a month. Um, and now we, for the first time, we can actually have a little bit of a three-dimension picture of where we're going, how you would enter obstacles before that. And now, of course, now it was allocated to each team, four in total. Can't remember what was the task of the fourth uh, team, but now three was allocated to different parts in the refinery. Um, then we had dummy mines that you can actually use, uh, and we realized got magnets that you, you put it onto the tank, uh, the magnets just grab onto the tank. Um, and then we realized something. Uh, we actually didn't realize it did, we would, we would realize it on the target itself is the noise that that magnets make if it clicks onto the tank. Now, it's totally different when you are doing the training. You don't really think it's that loud. Um, and then he had a, a time mechanism, and I think as well as a, a lit safety mechanism. It was deal, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and... We rehearsed and carried on. We had our last full dress rehearsal, and then we left. Um, from uh, Longobarn, we left uh, at night, and, and the strike half is a very low-profile 
uh, it's like a tech vessel. It had, it got two 76 millimeter cannons, uh, one in, in the back and one in front, and then also missiles, um, air to sea, I mean sea to air missiles. On. And we were allocated to the back part. Uh, that was where our cabins was. And the other thing that we were told is you can shower every second day. Uh, it, the vessel had a system where it refined seawater into drinkable water. Um, and that's the same water that you can shower in. You can shower for about 30 seconds or one minute, and then you finish. Um, then you, every once a day, uh, or every second day, two guys were allocated to go and fetch the food in front. <laughs> now you're not allowed to walk on top because it's a very low pro profile, but and so you're very close to the water level. So you have to walk inside, and, and part of that is going through the radar room where everything is green. And normally the guys that came back is as green as that screen. <laughs> We're not used to the up and told the <laughs> of the craft. And normally that guys don't eat as well. <laughs> so, and I remember here the second day I was, I was uh, sleeping in the middle bunker. Uh, there was an alarm there that would go off five o'clock in the morning and it would say, wakey, wakey, rise and shine, uh, feet and socks. And so it carried on. The last part, a little bit sensitive. It was the Navy's wake-up call, and then they... But now that part was only occupied by us. So the third day, I decided, no way. I stripped this alarm, so the next day, it was only a little arm running <laughs> up and down. <laughs> and then, as we got closer, now we international, uh, we rebunked, uh, we uh, refueled in Wal Walfus Bay. Uh, that is uh, in Namibia. We sneaked in there at, in, at night, in the night. Everything happened in the night. Nobody was allowed on the deck, so nobody could see us. Um, we rebunked and then we left uh, for Lepito. And then when we was in the international waters, the, the Navy start uh, firing the 76 millimeter cannons. So we were where we slept was right underneath one of these cannons. And it, it felt like if that thing goes off, it felt like the air sucked in and then release again. So it was a weird feeling. Um, so now we would, de it works in a schedule like D, D minus one, it means D day to target. And then, um, oh yeah, something I remember, there was a medical doctor allocated to us. Now he was part of the briefing. And, and now when at the briefing, when the Navy explained their part and it was explained that where we're going and we actually know now exactly where we were going, the doctor was stunned. He said, you guys are mad. This is a suicide mission. <laughs> he didn't realize that we do that kind of operations. But that was our first one anyway. So then we run into HR. Uh, H minus five, H hour means uh, the actual time on, on target. And then about, I think, H minus four hours. Then they would uh, close the actual uh, windows, which was just like a port. They would close it with a lid, and then it's no lights outside, no lights inside. And they would put on a like a red light, if I remember correctly, to get your eyes climatized to the actual dark. Um, we had the uh, D, D minus one, we had a quick rehearsal uh, on top of the strike off where we fired our, our rifles. And now we were now uh, D minus three. So now we were waiting, everything was ready, you had your I think one or two lumpet mines. And uh, then the, the first thing uh, uh, was the actual guys from Four Ricky was dispatched. And they start preparing uh, the Zodiacs. And then it was H hour. So we climbed onto the deck. Uh, 
four four. I remember. I think it's four guys. Four guys in total. Each side in, in the zodiac. Then the zodiac will come around, and and of course now we've rehearsed this before. It is uh, like grab nets. It's net that they throw over the side, and then you climb down this net, and then you must time, you must keep in consideration. Uh, the moving of both vessels, the Zodiac and the Strikecraft. And then, of course, it's going up and down. It's not like you just walk a step and you into the Zodiac. You have to time it. When it comes up and it's close to you, you jump. If you fall in between there, you're gone. Uh, so that was quite hair raising. Uh, even if you rehearsed it, it's different. Because when we rehearsed it, it wasn't the sea wasn't that rough. So yeah, then we meet up at the back, and then we start entering. Uh, then we start. We could see the lights of uh, the Peter Harbor, and all of a sudden it looks like daylight. Um, the strike craft itself had lights on that would look similar to. Uh, the boats that used for fishing, the same kind of lights. And we know what it would look like in the harbor. It was rehearsed before. And now we could see all these small lights of fisher boats lying uh, around us. And so we, we in, inside the zodiacs, were lying flat, as far as flat as we can. And then we slowly enter into the bitter harbor. And it was getting more, it was now, but there's a lot of spray lights there. And as we look, we saw here, there's, there's a couple of birds walking on the water. This, that's very funny. And the next thing we stuck, so it was uh, mud. So we had to climb up and push the zodiac until we over that part. Now, that wasn't rehearsed, but yeah, so we got the zodiacs out of the mud and full of mud and wet, we back into the zodiacs. And then we start approaching the, the actual uh, uh, desert uh, where we dropped off. And I remember as we entered, uh, there was um, a hell of a party going on. Uh, and the old Namibian friend of mine, Dita, told me after that, he knows exactly where that party, where that club is. It was always that was a, a hot spot. So we sneaked past this place with this party still carrying on there. And uh, we, then we split up into the three different targets. Uh, we had a bolt cutter. We had to cut the, the wire getting through it. And we had a small fold up ladder as well. Just in case we couldn't get through the fence, we had to climb over the fence. But that we left at the actual, uh, where we opened the hull, we left it there. It was too clumsy to carry it around. And then I remember we entered into the uh, a refinery, the farm. Let's call it the farm where all the tanks are. And I remember we walked over a, a small metal bridge. And yeah, that the moment we stepped on it, it sort of bent down. And the moment you're off the bridge, it jumps up again. And it sounds like a a rifle shot, God, it was, especially when everything you tense and, and everything is quiet and you try to keep everything quiet. And there were guards inside the refinery. Uh, luckily for us, they weren't at that part of the refinery. Maybe our uh, information or info beforehand was that they, they would roam around. But you know, guards, sometimes they lazy and don't stick to exact hours. And then we would go into the tank part, uh, farm. I can remember it was me, James Tate, uh, uh, Mugger. That was his nickname, Mugger. <laughs> and I think Johnny de Guevara. <laughs> we were the four-man team. And then the other thing we had to do, if it's you, you feel with your hand if the tank is hot, because um, if that is the scenario, we will have a problem with the safety mechanism, if it was only the lit, I can't remember. I think it was only the lit uh, getaway with about six hours. Um, and then what you do, you would put it against the tank 
And that's when we realized when that magnets jump out, it sounds like a pistol shot. It's not quiet. So if you were about one or two tanks away from there, you would have picked it up. Um, and then we pulled the pin, and that was one of the drills. You have to come back with the pin so that the team leader can count all the pins. And you know, okay, that's the exact amount of limpets that's activated. And then we withdraw. Uh, I think more or less the same spot where we were dropped off. And the hover was carrying on with the normal uh, activity. There's a lot of spray lights. There's a lot of movement there. Fortunately, none of the fish uh, uh, boats picked us up. And we sneaked out of the harbor in RV and all four uh, Zodiacs left. And then we had the same um, RV or navigation method that we had once in the bush, I told you, is that the Navy had a searchlight on the strike craft. And they also changed that lid, uh, that, that uh, lid or the glass in front with infrared. And we would have one uh, night vision equipment. And with that, you can easily get a direct line of, of sight. And they weren't that far out. They were about 10 case outside the harbor, which was very close in comparison to one of our other operations where they were much deeper in. This was less than nine case. But now, less than 10 case, they were hovering around waiting for us. And we were actually still on our way to the strike craft. Then the first limpet mines went off. So it was unbelievable. It was, you, you can't describe it. Uh, and it, then it went off one after the one after the other. And then in the harbor itself, it was chaos. And the guys on, on, the, on the Navy that they, they monitor the frequencies and they, there was one captain and he sounded like a Russian guy. All that he was yelling is cut the ropes, cut the ropes because they wanted, it looks like the harbor was now also on, on flames. And as you can see on that photo there, there's two bottles of champagne or let's call it sparkling wine. <laughs> I sneaked it in because it was my 21st birthday. So that was an excellent birthday gift that we received there. And now it was chaos in, in the, the harbor. And the boats was just one after the other getting trying to get out, out of uh, Libito Harbor. And we were then again uh, sneak on the sides of the strike craft. And then you have to climb up the rope ladders again. And then we celebrate on top. And, and the Navy guys were so curious. Said, what the hell did you guys do? What did you do? <laughs> because they weren't informed at all. It was only the captains, the two captains of the strike craft that know exactly what we're going to do. And eventually they realized what we were doing. And yeah, we, and then it was um, the full throttle. I think that each of these strike, strike craft got two or four. Uh, 16 cylinder diesel engines that is a beautiful noise and they went directly east to get out of the area before there is any reaction out of it yeah and that was libido 100% successful and it, uh, we learned a lot out of that now I have a lot of questions obviously and I congratulate myself on keeping quiet so long <laughs> 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 well, I'll put the picture here of uh, Admiral Woodburn. He later became Admiral Ned of the Navy. He was a man who was very highly decorated. And in a future mission, he did something very, very brave, which yeah. I hope he was decorated for as a role bridge. But we'll talk about that probably in the next episode. He was famous as a Navy man. Anyone in the South African Navy would know who was, who was Woodburn. But then I have to ask you a question here. This medical doctor who was so shocked, he wasn't one of you. He was just assigned to you. He wasn't a trained operator. No, he was uh, from 7 Met. Uh, 7 Met was the, the doctors and the medics. That's operational. That's deployed operational. Not, not in South Africa. Uh, not in Namibia. So they would be allocated to this kind of operation. 
and um, Kerslach as well went, things really went bad. Uh, there was yes, a doctor. I would like to speak about Kerslach. Um, Kerslach is important because several things came out of it. Was this before or after Kerslach? Um, this was before Kerslach. Yeah, yes, Kerslach was after. Was the first, first um, maritime the ever for, for Yeah, one yeah. Yes, and, and, and four as well, where four was involved uh, as, the, as the coxswains. And um, yeah, if I think of the size of a zodiac, uh, probably we didn't have, normally we would have a coxswain and, and a, let's call it a 2IB. There was, uh, as far as I remember, only the coxswain. Of course, all of us were trying to, uh, to skip a zodiac. It's not that difficult, but it's a different scenario if the waves is not uh, with you. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I remember the Zodiac was also camouflaged, so everything was camouflaged. There was nothing that could give us away. Well, perhaps uh, you can explain this to us. I mean, all this has taken a place at night. So I can correct. imagine these dark and dark warships, the Zodiacs around them, you people climbing down in the darkness, hoping that, of course, you don't get squashed between the vessel and the Zodiac, you would be dead. Because exactly, I think that the uh, warship is, is, is moving forward. It's propellers exactly. are spinning. It can't just stand still. And so if you fall in there, those propellers will probably get hold of you if you don't drop. Because you're yeah. already loaded, even if your explosives are already inside the boat. Yeah, and so, then of course, also these guys on, on the coxswains on the Zodiacs were experienced. So they know that what they were doing, I mean, to maneuver, you have to keep in mind that you are going to climb down one by one here. You have to line his direction with the strike craft. The strike craft have to be exactly on one compass bearing. So yeah, that that by itself was hair raising. It's actually pretty. There was never a video made about it. Uh, but yeah, everything was pitch dark. It was no lights, except one or two lights that that, uh, that looks like a fisher, fisher, fisher trailer. Yes, they disguised themselves probably with um, the navigational lights, the way I always did it. Yeah. It's fascinating to me, I mean, but, but can you tell us, later years, South African Special Forces became quite famous at doing, using ski boats. Now, what would be the difference between the two and why was the switch made from Robert Dox? So yeah, ski boats? the Robert Dox, of course, is, is uh, inflatable. Uh, pontoons so if, if it hit by a bullet you in trouble and we of course we had the life jackets on the life jackets we we would leave in in the zodiac uh, during the operation and then just put it on again but yeah floating there around in the middle of the sea uh, while your your only way of transport back to the strike off is sinking yeah so that was the, the zodiac was very vulnerable and then of course speed um uh, they only had, uh, I would say, 40, 50, no, probably uh, 40 horsepower. So, and, and then we were quite laden with, okay, the mines weren't that heavy. I think the mines was about five kilograms. And then each of us averaged 75 kilograms. So that on top, and then the skipper himself, uh, so your, your, your speed, you didn't have a high speed. We with the, uh, uh, the ski boats afterwards, they had two 150 outboard uh, Yamaha engines on. They were solid, they were rigid. So they could take the waves uh, much better than the Zodiac. And of course we had speed and they were called Barracuda. I think it's specific, uh, uh, it's boats that is internationally known. And then it, um, inside the boat, there would be two rows where we can sit and you can actually hold onto, there's like a strap, you can hold onto it. With the Zodiac, you, you fall around. So yeah, it and was- had longer range, I think, and also- you're Yes. More, more protected probably. It, and yeah. then, if you've seen the waves on our southern African coast, <laughs> You, you will yeah. understand what I mean. You can't. It's it really those those waves can be 10, 12 feet. And yes, you need yeah. to get in and out. It, it takes real skills from the skippers of those boats for coxswains. Coxswains, yeah. they say that right. Well, anyway, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, Kerslach. 
Wat happened het Kerslug is weer? Kerslug, uh, ja. Candlelight, I think it's Every, candlelight. Yeah, candlelight. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it, and it ended up a candlelight. What happened there is exactly, and, and that's why I think uh, our limpets uh, only had the, the lead mechanism as a getaway. And their limpets were exactly the same. Only a lead mechanism for safety. And what happened there is, I'm not going to go in the hell operation, I'm just going to tell what, what went wrong. Is the, uh, when they put the limpets on the tanks, the tanks were very hot. And that was something that didn't happen to us. And that, that was something that uh, wasn't uh, informed or nobody knew that the tanks were hot. So instead of your six hours get away, it ended up 10 minutes. So the guys were, were still in a refinery farm when the first limpet went off. And unfortunately what happened, uh, Cocky the cook, he was also a cocky the cook, small officer, very popular. Um, he put a limpet on the tank and he couldn't get the safety pin out. So he took it off and he put it between his legs and then he pulled the safety pin. But what happened in the meanwhile is that lead strip dropped out. So it went off instantaneously. He disintegrated. The other two guys close to him, Cloppies and uh, Pit Van Sail, were blown out of their clothes. Bose was like blind. And that was chaos in the oil refinery. So that is the kind of things that was rehearsed, luckily. But what wasn't rehearsed is that your getaway time is now 15 minutes. The limpets start uh, exploding already. So luckily the guys' drills were good, so they had to evacuate. The two guys' cocky were gone. Um, and then, of course, the, the doctors, I had, I've got a photo, somebody can send us the photo of where they actually work on cloppies, on, on the, the, the vessels, um, operating on them. It was just blood. And, uh, Cloppy survived that, pit fike as well, but the, after that he had to wear th very thick glasses to be able to see again. Uh, ironically, another incident happened to Cloppy afterwards. After he left uh, reconnaissance regiment, he did uh, mine detecting and he was walking with a throttling stick and he picked up something and and he had to stick under his arm and he took a camera out. And as he leaned forward, that stick brought right onto the mine and it exploded. And he lost his eyesight and he lost his hearing as well. Yeah, so that was really bad. But yeah, that was Kerslach. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, fortunately that they escaped and evade immediately. And the strike crafts went left. I understand that the rest of the teams actually went back inside to search for these wounded men and they brought them out. Yes, yeah, yeah we don't leave. Running, but they went back we, inside to fetch me. Yeah, that was our drills. We don't never leave anybody behind, dead or alive. Uh, Koki himself disintegrated, so there was nothing that could be taken back. And I mean, yeah, you just think yourself, PT in between five and 10 kilograms, and it's a uh, like I said, the actual temperature, if it goes off, is way above a thousand cc. So the lessons which we learned here is if you want to blow up something like a oil refinery and those tanks are super hot, you cannot use a lead uh, type of detonator yes. or time delayer. You can't do that. It will, not yeah. it will melt. They after they brought in a, a, a time mechanism as well. So if the lead goes off, Nothing happened. Both must uh, be stimulated. I believe that you said to me in the Afrikaans version of this that these limpet mines uh, were painted the same color as the uh, yeah. tanks. So you couldn't like, really plot them. Yeah, like a silver gray. So yeah, it's, it's uh, 
They didn't have any uh, anti-tampering devices. I think the risk was just too high because if you, uh, the tank is not 100% smooth, it's like a little bit of a sun plot, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. And it's not 100%. So there was no getaway mechanisms there. I think there were one that didn't go off, one or two, because afterwards there were photos of, of that uh, in the Angolan newspapers. And, and I did pick up a cocky's boots as well. Yeah, that was also displayed with, with the limpet mines. The one limpet mine, I think, that didn't go off. Yeah, that's true. They, they did that. I know with a libido right I understand that South African firefighter teams actually had to go and put it out. I'm not sure if that's true. I've heard somewhere that I don't yeah. really know. If, I'm not sure if it happened at this one at Kerslough too, which was at a different place in Angola. Um, sadly, when something happened back in South Africa, there was, after Kerslough now, there was a bit of a dispute between the general officers from the normal army, regular army, and special forces. If you can just tell us briefly what happened. Yeah, we had a debriefing. Uh, of course, we, we are the lower ranks, and there was a general, a couple of high, other uh, high-ranking officers from HQ, which is in Victoria. Uh, we had a debriefing at one. No, I think it was at HQ. Uh, but now we had a lot of operators there. And the feeling I got out of it, yeah, I can tell it now, nothing, nothing can happen to me, is that they tried to blame the operators for this. Where it was um, the fact that Cocky pulled off the lumpet and pulled the safety pin when he held it between his legs. Maybe not 100% correct, but for that matter, uh, they say that that was the, the cause why we had the lead strip drop out. But, well, you can't have a, a, a safety fear, a safety mechanism on, on a limpet mine. It could just have also happened when he uh, put it there against the, the tank that it could drop off. So, yeah, the, we and not only myself were, got the feeling that I tried to put the blame on the operators. Uh, well, we weren't very happy when we walked out there because we lost one of our comrades, friends, and two were badly injured. Of course, you know, the entire purpose of special forces is to, to be deniable. And in this case, I think it exploded with Kerslev in their faces because they had the body, they had parts of the body anyway. And yeah. so they probably knew. But this explosives for um, limpet mines were Russian made. It's not South African, was it? It was captured just like a normal limpet, which you would use that, uh, to sink the ship. Yeah, I, th I think it, it, it also had a PET in. Uh, yes, yeah, so the explosives were changed. Yeah, but uh, it looks like a standard limpet mine. So, yeah. Okay, well, that, that was quite interesting, but I think you should explain to us quickly this picture behind me. You referred to it where you were, let's call it celebrating the most glorious 21st <laughs> birthday. I've ever heard of in my life. It was a fantastic sight. It's a yeah. you don't have pictures, but there are some markings on your uniform. It's where you're the one standing there upright and you're grinning there to somebody. It's all yeah, to me it because it's be... a different way, you know, when I see it and what you were look, uh, watching, you see it. But anyway, what's the, what are those numbers on your shirt? What, what are they supposed to okay, be? Okay, yeah. The guy behind me that's already took his black is beautiful off his face, that's Doe Stein. Uh, I'm handing the bottle over to him there. there on, on my, I think on my right chest, yeah, there's uh, your blood group with the O positive. And then there would be another number that was allocated to each team, a number, so that if anything goes wrong and we had to make uh, communication between the four teams, then we would talk of team, I can't see the number there anymore. Let's say team 007. Uh, 
And then everybody would know, okay, Team 007 is deployed there in the refinery. It's is via uh, James Tate and Mugger. That's the guys in that team. So you would know exactly if you have to respond, this is the four guys there. This is the guys you're looking for. So no names, we only work on that numbers uh, to keep it uh, clandestine. Yeah, so Steiner everybody... At that stage, Pardon? Uh, Doe Steiner at that stage was part of one Ricky or part of four Ricky because he became famous. He wrote that book, Iron Fist from the Sea, which is an excellent Correct. book. Yeah. Uh, he was initially f from one and then he went over to four. Yeah, so he had he lies uh, with the um, strike cross. Uh, so he covered the night, all that kind of movement. Yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of backup behind this that a lot of it I don't even know about. Probably there were uh, aircraft in the air uh, on standby in Namibia, they maybe were C 130s with as a backup with equipment or extra. Zodiacs to deploy them, these kind of things. So it's a very much involved operation. I'm just basically only picturing our part. Well, I think that concludes uh, the video, right? It's one of those fantastic operations. It went down as probably the most successful one uh, of a lot of it. And it was the first one, so it, that, that makes it unique as well. And then we'll leave it there and we will come back for another episode where we will speak about, I believe, as your old bridge, as well as South Africa's attempt to an aircraft carrier. And something very strange happened there, but I'm sure you'll <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>